Today we're talking about how to suggest light in your painting. And suggesting light is a lot more than just copying the right color and value in the reference. It's more about understanding the light source, where it's coming from, how it affects the shapes and values, and then being able to mix the color that best su suggests the light that we're seeing. Now today we're talking about suggesting light in our paint. And there's several things to remember, three things here. One is identifying the type of light, and I'll go over those in a minute. Two is, like everything else that I learned and I talk about, is simplifying. And three is comparing. And when you compare in your painting, what you're doing is you're comparing the values between the shapes. And you do that by not looking directly at what we want to mix, but look at the value next to it. So if I want to get a light value, I look at a dark value next to it. And the same thing, if I want to mix a dark value, I compare it to the light next to it. I stare at the light and out of my peripheral vision, I see how much darker the dark is. Without comparing, the values will always be wrong. And that's probably the biggest thing in suggesting the light, is comparing the values to each other. Don't stare directly at what you're going to mix. Look at the value next to it. That's something you have to remind yourself to do over and over again, because we're so geared to just copying the photograph. And the photograph, although we think of it as reality, you know, really isn't. The color process is totally different from painting process. So even if we copy the photograph exactly, we don't necessarily have a sense of light in there because our colors in our palette are different. So we need to paint what we know as well as what we see. So starting with the types of light, I'll go through those. This is uh, flat lighting. The light is straight overhead. It's you know, somewhere up here and the light's coming straight down and there's just no shadow variation. There's color variation, you know, the light field light yellow field, dark green field, but there's no sunlight shadow variation. Very flat and not a great time of day to go out and paint, although you do learn a lot from doing it. But the shadows are very small, no big areas of dark breaking things up. So that is flat. This is with the sun behind me. The sun's in behind and it's hitting the front of everything. You can call it frontal lighting, maybe, but it has more contrast. It's actually a bit over to the side, but not much. It's still frontal. You can see the front of the buildings catching sunlight, the front of the trees. There's a lot of shadow and uh, sunlight here. Still a little flat, but a lot better. And sometimes the frontal lighting does flatten things out. It, it can just whitewash everything, similar to overhead lighting. So then we get to backlighting with the sun in front here, you know, it could be over here, anywhere along the front. Generally, I don't take photographs or paint directly into the sun if the sun is just right here. So here the sun's, you know, you really can't see it, but it is in front of me and it's creating a backlighting, shadows standing upright and lights on the tops and on the flat plane. Then the others, this is cloud shadows. You have landscapes where you have clouds or uh, casting big shadows over the landscape, and that creates a lot of contrast, a lot of drama. Like you can see the light on the trees here and the cloud shadow on the mountain creates great contrast right in here. If I'm out photographing or painting and it's a kind of a semi-cloudy day, you get a lot of cloud shadows. So I look for those because they really help with the lighting. And this is kind of a front or foreground shadow and background shadow where you have shadow in front, sunlight in the middle, and shadow in the back. And again, creates a lot of drama, similar to cloud shadow lighting. This has kind of the light sandwiched between the foreground and background. Again, a lot of contrast, a lot of drama. And these are things I look for because they make painting the sunlight more simple, but not just more simple, but it, it's more interesting. It's more dramatic, a lot more dramatic than the flat light. Now, there's some things I like about this, but it does not have the drama that this has. And then the other, again, is foreground shadow, sunlight in the background, shadow in the foreground. And the shadow causes the viewer kind of to jump over the foreground and go right to the focal point. It gets rid of all the messiness in the foreground that can kind of take the attention away. And I could break up the foreground with some light, but then he comes more dappled lighting. But again, very strong composition, has very strong sunlight shadow, 
And then last of all, uh, dappled lighting, where I have shadow areas, uh, foreground, middle ground, usually in the foreground of dappled lighting, light and dark on the foreground, in this case on the grass and in the house. And creates a lot of interest, a lot of dark and light contrast, and a lot of warm and cool contrast. And I'm always looking for those. You don't always have, if I'm traveling and painting, uh, I paint in the middle of the day where it's flat, just because I'm, that's my goal, is to get out and do as much painting as possible. So I'm painting all day long, and I'll paint flat lighting as well. But it's not as interesting. Now, getting back to these, what I'm looking for, this is where the sun is behind me. It's more frontal lighting. And like everything else, if I can simplify the shadow pattern, it's going to be easier to make those shadows pop out and become more definite. If I don't simplify it, the darks are going to be scattered around like this. You can see in the, in the trees, the darks are just kind of dotted. There is a definite shadow pattern there, but you have to simplify it and make it work better by simplifying it. So if I can pull that shadow pattern together, increase the temperature, making the shadows cooler, making the shadows darker in front here, and then a little lighter back there to show depth. But finding that shadow pattern, because when the sun is behind me and the lighting is in front, front of lighting, the darks kind of get scattered all over. But pull them together, then it's a lot easier to get that contrast. Again, just copying the photograph is not going to get it. And you can see it. It's just broken up with a lot of little darks in there that make it harder to pull it together. So spend more time finding that shadow pattern when you have that frontal lighting. And then the back lighting, everything that's upright becomes instantly darker. And the lights on the uprights become more rim lighting. Lights following the form. And it's very, again, very scattered, very busy looking. So what I want to do is simplify it make those uprights a more definite dark, and then have the lights follow the form. Now, I can't soften the edges. Well, I mean, I can, but it just takes too long. I don't want to paint this. I just want to show the dark and light values. Edges are too hard. You'd want to soften them. But this shows that backlighting better. If I can simplify the darks, make them stand upright more by getting these darks bigger, more definite. In uh, the photograph, it's, it's hard to get that feel of the darks taking over the trees. I mean, they do, but the lights just pepper the shadows too much. But if I can simplify it, that's easier to read. And the easier the light is to read in your painting, the more successful it is. And then pushing the temperature contrast. Always having, for the most part, the vertical shadows on the trees are going to be darker than the shadows on the ground. Both are going to be a lot cooler than the photograph. Photograph does not have as much temperature change as we need in the painting. Now, as far as temperature goes, there are some painters don't even use blue. Black is their blue, and they use earth colors for yellow and red, and then they use white. So they're not using temperature at all. They are to some degree, but black is their cool color. And they're really focused more on, on value, but you can still get temperature change using black, yellow ochre, and a muted red. It's just not as strong. With the primary colors we have on our palette and secondary colors, you can get a lot stronger temperature changes. So you want to practice pushing those a lot more. Don't try and be so subtle as to try and match the photograph because that's not going to give you much temperature change. In this one with the cloud shadow, there's really not much cool temperature color in there at all. So I want to push it more. So pushing the background hill more of a muted violet, the trees more of a muted blue-green. Now how strong I make the color really has nothing to do with it. I do tend to add a little bit of the complement to every color. So my violet back in here has a little yellow or yellow-orange in it. Not much. The blue-green here has a little bit of cad red or alizarin in it. Always want to mute it slightly, but how strong you make it or how gray you make it really doesn't affect the suggestion of sunlight. It's more the temperature and the value. Now, obviously you can make things all the way on the gray side, then you lose temperature. But whether it's real strong or more muted really doesn't matter. Now going to the kind of the sandwich lighting, the shadowed foreground, sunlit, middle ground, shadow background. I want to, again, increase the temperature than the photograph has. The road here on this photograph, we have to pick a color from the color wheel. That road to me is an orange. It's a light orange and a dark orange. But in that dark orange, I want to push more of the temperature, the cool colors. 
So I might combine the blue or blue-violet with some orange or reddish orange to get the color I want. Because the shadows have to have a cool color to them, because that's the color of shadows. No matter what the object is, whether it's a green tree, orange road, red mountain, there has to be cool colors in the shadow. So I can start the shadow with violet, then come back and add a little orange to it, or I can mix the violet and orange together, as long as the I, I think the violet kind of dominates a little bit. And then in the light area, I'm really pushing the white and orange, or yellow-orange, with a touch of the complement because I don't want everything just screaming at me. I also don't want the hay bales here to be the same value and color as that, so I have to make sure the road's slightly darker. Hay bales a bit more on the yellow side and maybe the road a bit more on the orange side. They're a little too close together color-wise there. And then the shadows on the hay bales are going to be cooler than the hay bales themselves in the sunlight. But they're, they're not as cold as the, the cast shadows on the ground because there's so much strong sunlight here bouncing around. It warms up those small shadows on the hay bale. Same thing with the sunlit cliff. The shadows on the sunlit part of the cliff, the small shadows, actually warm up a little bit because of light bouncing around. And that's what I did here. I added more orange and yellow to the violet. So the orange and yellow now dominate because of the reflected light. But if I can keep these background colors cooler and lighter because they're in the shadow, but they're also a little further away, cooler and lighter than the foreground, then I'm gonna get the effect of that stuff receding. But the only way to keep it in the shadow is to ignore the photograph to some degree and that that color does not give me the cooler temperature I want. The greens and the trees don't either. They're not really cool or warm. They're just kind of green. So the more I can push it to the extreme a bit more, more bluish green, more violet. And my violet's pretty strong. And again, it, it's up to the artist to decide if they want to gray that violet a lot more or keep it real strong violet. The stronger we keep the temperature contrast, the more sense of light. And the temperature works if the values work. So value and temperature is the main thing we're looking for in the colors and values. Now this is the foreground shadow, it allows the house in the background pop out more and the light in the background. It's a real, again, real dramatic lighting because there's so much dark and light contrast and warm and cool. And the same thing here. I just want to cool down these shadows even more. I can break up some the shadow in the foreground, but I don't want to do it too much. Might have done it a bit too much here because my focal points, the white barn, uh, and some of the stuff going on back in there. So the shadow in the foreground effectively allows the viewer just to kind of jump over the foreground and get here quicker. There's no lights and darks in the foreground to, or not too many of them, to distract you from getting to the focal point. And how you design the shapes, you know, the dark tree that's in the shadow creates dark masses against the light sky. There's a lot of compositional changes to make here, but the lighting is a foreground shadow lighting. And the more I can identify with that, then it, be, it kind of clicks in my head, well, that's what I want to push, that warmer sunlight and the cooler foreground. And that becomes my goal. And this is the dappled lighting. And again, just kind of breaking up the shadow and the foreground and the middle ground, pushing the temperature. Again, slightly muted yellow-green, a slightly muted blue-green, and some violet. I scrubbed some violet in here to really emphasize that cool against warm. Same thing on the house. I tend to ignore, at first, you know, the windows, the doors. I don't want to draw that stuff. I would rather block it in more solid and then draw right on top of the paint, get a darker value for the window. Now you can draw first, but when I do that, the details tend to take over and the bigger shapes and the sense of light tends to suffer a little bit. Now I can scrape after I get it filled in with kind of that rubber wedged scraper. But don't draw too much in the beginning. Just get the big shapes right. As we're thinking about the light, you know, identify the light and then structure all the darks, the simplified dark and light shapes to that. In backlighting, I want to make sure the dark trees are more of a solid dark with just light hitting the edges. Same thing with the shrubbery, that there's strong contrast between the cast shadows and the light. So. And then last of all, compare when I want to see, and in this photograph, the shadows are way too dark. Now this is just black in here. So I want a value difference. Typically the shadows get lighter as they go back. Not so here because this tree or the shrubbery is catching some reflected light or it's a different color. 
a bit lighter yellow green than the trees but this shadow here is a little lighter and warmer than the background so if I have a shadow in the foreground that is lighter than a shadow in the background it's generally also warmer I mean the rule of thumb is shadows get lighter as they recede there's a few exceptions and in those exceptions the shadows also are a bit warmer still cooler than the light area but a bit warmer as you can see here than the background but simplifying the shapes allows me to identify the light better or generally identify the light first, simplify the shapes to suggest that light, and then really push the temperature, the warm against cool, and compare the values. So if I want to see how dark the trees are here, I will look at the light here or the sky, and out of my peripheral vision, I'll get a better relationship or get a better value of that dark. Same thing with the light here. I'll stare at the cast shadow or the water and or the water and get a better value. So identifying the light, simplifying, and then comparing the shapes and push the temperature to really suggest the light in your painting.